Welcome back to the Florida Band Podcast. As our tagline says, you know why you're here. We're talking. We're here to talk Florida. Hey, Band. hey, hey, hey! I actually, I, I just thought of a tagline. Do you mind? Yeah. What's up? What What if our tagline is, "Welcome to the Florida Band Podcast," where we talk about fitness. No fitness, fitness instruments to your students. Oh, uh, because that's what we're talking about today is fittings. My name is Andrew Lopez. I'm the director at Condison Middle School uh, in West Palm Beach. And I'm Christian Gordon. I'm one of the band directors at West Glades Middle School in Parkland, Florida. And once again, this is the Florida Band Podcast, Episode 2. Like we talked about in our last episode, because last episode we were talking about the first day of school, uh, we left you guys talking about how we're going to talk about fittings. Um, talk about fitness fitness instrument or audio what, what if it's fit, fittendies? Fittendies. Fittendies what? Fitting these instruments into your students' hands. <laughs> Fitting these um, instruments to your band. Oh, God. I love I it. I know. So okay. Cringy. So we're talking about fitness. Uh, no, wait. We're talking about fittings. We're going to talk about instrument fittings today. Instrument fittings. Well, I promise we're not five. Um, I don't promise that. Uh, you know what? That's fair. Um, so we're talking about instrument fittings. Um, everything involved, you know, when our fittings take place, and then we're going to kind of go, uh, how our is different fittings work. And then we're also going to go into each instrument, what we're looking for, like, you know, what, what you, what you would want your kids to produce on their instruments when you're going through that process. And then after this episode, um, we're actually going to get into the draft. So these, you can kind of, you could, you could consider this a part one and part two, but they're two separate concepts. So, um, with the start, you know, it's, uh, let's just dive in because we've, we've been stupid long enough. Um, yep. so let's talk about when our fittings takes, uh, take place. What about you? Our fittings take place in the fall. There was a year where we did it in the spring, but we ended up still doing a fall fitting because not everybody that signed up for band came to the spring fitting because we had to hold the spring fitting after school. And uh, when we fit in the fall, we can do it during the school day. So we're just going to keep it in the fall. How about you? Uh, well, do you guys do like a petting zoo or anything like that? Oh, well, yeah, that's more recruiting, though. I guess that's true, isn't it? That's more recruiting for our recruiting episode, which will be coming. Yeah. So um, you? F- I, I considered doing my fittings in the spring it was once again it was going to be in 19 19 2019 2020 um we were going to set up a spring fitting because we were really gunning ho on making sure that we get everybody signed up for band early and then COVID hit so we never actually hit it but i've always done my my fittings in the fall when do you do yours in the fall because i do mine second week of school it's the second it's the second thursday of the school year so our school year starts on wednesday what about you well, tip, uh, we're starting this year, we're starting on a Tuesday, um, but we're going to jam pack it in t- as much as I can. I've, already, I've got it scheduled for that Thursday, so... Um, so you're going to do a fitting the f- first Thursday of your school year? No, second, second Thursday. Thursday. Okay. It's always the second Thursday. Okay. We would like to time ours after the first full week of school. So we would technically get 10 days of instruction and then do three days, not three days, one day of fitting. Sometimes it takes three days because the kids will do a fitting on the first day, but then our instrumentation isn't all the way quite there. And uh, we'll do a second and a third. But that's uh, without the extra help, which we're going to talk about in a second. Sure. And I mean, the reason I do mine on the second Thursday is because leading up to it, like obviously first day, we just talked about that. But on the second day up to that second Thursday, each day, I spend time in addition to talking about rhythms and talking about, um, you know, basic classroom management routines and all that stuff. I spend a day going over each instrument, talking about how to make the embouchure, how to play the instrument, how to make a basic sound. Um, And I use the Jupiter uh join the band kits that came out in covid i'm going to use those this year to hand out to each student and they'll get a chance to actually practice those embouchures like we'll spend a day on flute and we'll spend a day on clarinet and saxophone and and so on uh leading up to the fitting so that way by the time they get to the fitting the students aren't making sounds for the first time and they're actually able to get if not a better result a more accurate result of and they will have a better idea of what they want to play going into the fitting I want to amend what I said uh, just a second ago. I said that we'll do 
one day of uh, where everybody gets fitted, where we have the extra help, which we're going to talk about in a second. And then we'll do one or two days of supplemental fitting. We actually only did that once because that was the year where the spring prior we did um, the fittings after school. So actually in a normal year, when we just do fittings in the fall, it's just one day of fittings and then we're ready to um, assign instruments. The only way we would do more fittings is if somebody was absent that day, but that rarely happens. Yeah, and then there's also the <coughs> percussion fitting, which we'll get into at the end. Yeah, um. <laughs> I wanted to add one more thing, and that was, sure. so you mentioned um, what you do leading up to the fitting. Um, also, uh, yeah, we try to do 10 days of instruction. That'll include uh, rhythm counting and some of their music theory. Mm -hmm. And then um, what I also want to do, you gave me the idea, is to do some of the embouchure formation for the instruments that they're going to be interested in and if possible do some sound making but probably not because we don't have our hands on any of those jupiter kits but uh, you know even if it's just with their lips or something like that mm -hmm. or at least making the embouchure is going to be better than nothing so that's definitely something we're going to incorporate this school year you should talk to your um your principal or and your you should talk to fred schiff at all county to see if you can secure even just a class set like if you can get because you're going to have how many beginning bands two I don't know. Two or three. Still up in the air. Yeah, um, two or three. Hopefully Yeah, three. with COVID. So let's say like with the average beginning band, you've got like two or three beginning bands and you've got maybe 45 max or 50 max in a class. If you buy 50 um, and those Jupiter, those Jupiter kits are cheap, you could buy 50 and then you just take them home and put them in the dishwasher before the next day. So you could do like one. Um, just do it for three days. Yeah. One, one class per day. Yeah. Right. So how are you, though, going to get in your front loaded uh, instruction other than the embouchures before you're fitting? Um, well, for example, with, the rhythms. So what I typically my routine is, you know, we'll we'll start the class. Like, let's say we're doing day two. So we got flutes that day. So on day two, they'll come in and we'll I'll do a very quick pop quiz. Pop, it's, it's a pop quiz. It's not on paper. I'll just we'll just talk through what we talked about yesterday, I'll do like, okay, like you have like spend like five minutes talking about routines and I'll, I'll make it a game where if a kid gets a question, right. I'll be like, Hey guys, what are our three polite things? And they'll say, Oh, our three polite things are being silent. Oh, what's another one? Oh, being still. Well, can someone name all three? Oh, being silent, being still and closing your eyes for like, and for each kid that answers a question, I'll just give them like a pencil or something. Um, so I do that every day, every day at the beginning of class leading up to the fitting. So for the beginners, it's two every, it's two weeks of routines and classroom management. I just we drill it um then after that we immediately dive into rhythm work and we'll talk and you know i'll get them through chart one or i'll get them through however far we can get them in those first two weeks and then obviously continue after that and then after the rhythms then we go into uh sound production for whatever and we just dig dig into whatever instrument we're going to dig into that day so it's usually about 15 minutes at the front of class doing routines and rhythms and then the next 30 is content based off of instruments got it okay yeah, it works out all right we typically need some more time okay it also helps us you know the longer uh we're able to interact with the students the better we'll be able to understand instruments they're better suited for that too that's a good point okay so uh let's talk about how your fitting works and then we'll talk about how mine Okay, so the way we do it is um, we bring in, so in Palm Beach County, we our local store is Music Man. I know you guys have All County. I know Fort Myers and Lee County has, uh, and I think Collier too, has Cadence Music. And then I think in Orlando, they've got Music and Arts, and we also have Music and Arts here, um, but they've also got the band room. And, and a lot of, this is a common practice that um, a lot of middle schools do and if you if you don't but you have a music store nearby i recommend we bring in music man they bring in um i it's we work with our road rep they bring in a, a team of like maybe five or six or seven people um they'll bring in like a flute specialist they'll bring in a clarinet saxophone specialist a trumpet horn specialist or just a horn specialist i try to get a horn and trumpet separate people and then like a low brass and a tuba guy um and then people for double reads as well if we choose to do double, double reads that year um but we'll bring in they'll bring in a staff of professionals and we'll set them all around the room and the way it works is when the kids come in for that for fitting day they come in i give them instructions on how the fitting works just very basic like do this do this do this and then 
um, they go. The kids are given by Music Man a checklist. The checklist has all of the instruments listed that are being tried out, that are being available for the fitting. And the kids go from station to station, trying out the instruments, following the instructions of the professionals and the clinicians. And depending on how they perform, they get a score. Five is you're like the, the LeBron James of this instrument. So, or, uh, so you're like the Serena Williams, so good for you. Uh, one is stay away from this instrument at all costs and do something else. Sorry. Um, most kids will score between, uh, you know, three and a four. Um, I, there are some band directors out there who, who talk about, you know, you don't want to give, you don't want to give out kids, kids ones. Um, there are no ones in my band room, but we do, I do tell the clinicians if they don't sound good, give them a two, because I think it's important. I like, I think the sixth graders can handle like you, this instrument's not for you do something else so the so we'll you know and then a five is reserved for like the best possible sound and we'll get into what determines a five as we go through each instrument but they get those scores um and then at the end of the fitting after they've learned what instruments they're good at after they've learned what instruments they're not good at then they pick their top three choices and then we use those top three choices in the draft to determine their actual placement we'll get to that later um but the but the fitting usually takes one period and it's a madhouse. I typically try to tell my st my kids try to you and you you need to audition on at least six. Um, I know you do something slightly different, so and your your information is awesome on this on this point. Um, but we do. I tell them at least do six um, because if they do six, it guarantees that you cross instrument families, right? Um, unless you have that's that that works, right? Hold on, what's my math? Is my is my math? Yeah, bad? that works. That works. <laughs> okay. That works. Um, so it's. So we have your six, so they, they have to try out at least six, guaranteeing like, so like, let's say you try out flute, clarinet and saxophone, and all three of them are terrible. That probably means that you're a trumpet player or a trombone player or, or a low brass player. So, or a horn player. So it forces them to cross the aisle and, you know, figuratively and see exactly what instrument families they're best at so they can best gauge their own potential. Um, you know, uh, you're gonna have, I, we can get a little more into it but that's basically the the gist of how it works it takes a day i do invite my principal he loves that day because it's like he gets he gets to watch the chaos right um and i get to kind of you get it's a chance for you to kind of flex your classroom management but that's that's in a in a nutshell how mine works what about you all right so for hours we bring in our local instrument provider all county music uh owned by fred schiff and he actually has been in person at our fittings uh, which has been awesome. That's cool. Um, and he'll, he or one of his um, employees will give a little spiel to the kids, get them really excited and let them know that uh, their score is going to be between a one and a five. They tell us behind closed doors that they don't give out any ones and uh, the lowest will give us a two, but they just try to stick between the three and the five range. Uh, what they do a little different from yours is uh, uh, if, if a kid is the LeBron James or Serena Williams of, of a particular instrument, they'll give a five plus. But Ooh. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just fancy. to make sure the kid knows uh, that uh, they should be on the instrument. So um, let's see. We set up in the cafeteria and it is Ooh, during their band cool. class and um, they try to divide out um, so kids don't run to the very first station they see and there's this long line and all the other stations are just sitting there empty. We divide out to uh, to keep everybody moving. But once they go to their first station, they can go to any other station, but they're encouraged to go to stations that have the shortest line so that they can get as many scores as they can. We encourage students to try everything, and we tell them that uh, the more the more instruments that they enjoy, the better opportunity they're going to have to get the instrument that they want. And so they'll let us know their first, second, and third choice after they get their scores. But out of you know, we don't want them only set on one instrument. We want them set on three instruments so that they get one of those three, and then. Um, yeah, we do have a flute person, we have a double reed person, a clarinet sax person, a high brass person, and a low brass person, and we don't do percussion at this fitting. Um, another thing that's important is uh, to, to encourage the kids to try everything, 
we say, let's see how many fives you can get on your scorecard. And so that encourages students to try all 10 or 11, 10 instruments, I believe it is. Try all the instruments that are there. And, uh, and they can also try more than once. I don't know if you mentioned if yours can, but. Uh, oh yeah, do you, um, do you have problems getting kids not auditioning all of them? I don't know, like. Um, not a problem. It's cool. happened every now and then. They'll go, I got a five on the instrument I want. And I'll say, that's awesome. But you're not done until you get a score for all the instruments. Go, you know, go try them and you never know. See how many fives you can get. You know, we find that the more fives that they have, the less disappointed they are if they don't get the first choice. And by, by motivating kids to do as many fives as they want, that encourages them to go back and try again. Yeah. And actually, that, you know, put forth effort. So that's cool. See how many fives you can get. That's that's our uh, I might, mindset I might, behind that. I might steal that and combine that with mine where it's like you you want to do at least six, but you need to see how many fives you can get and the more and just pump up, you know, the more instruments that you do um, with one, you might be good. I guess we're going to go ahead and dive in what we look for in each instrument. Yeah. You want to start with flute? Sure. I'll start with flute. We're going to go in score order all the way down and we'll do percussion for last. I didn't list percussion in the outline, I'll, uh, but it's, it's there. Oh, right. I'll just type it in real quick. It's all good. So, um, so for flute, for us, we try to get two pitches, uh, a low pitch and a high pitch, either on the head joint or on the instrument itself. And usually with the closed hand, closed head joint, it's easier. If they can mm -hmm. get it on a, on without the closed, if they can do it on an open head joint, they'll get a five. If they can't, they'll get a four or less. Um, and then we do look for embouchure wise, the teardrop on the upper lip. We try to avoid uh, having students play the flute if they have a teardrop. If they're able to test really well on it, then that's fine. But we let them know ahead of time, if you have a teardrop, the flute might not be the best instrument for you. But that's basically it. Yes, yeah, we do the same. Um, I've always been really lucky to have a really big, like we've, Music Man always finds really, really good flute auditioners and flute clinicians to come in. So I kind of just let them do what they want. Like a, a couple of them have been like retired band directors. And when that's the case, I'm like, just do your thing and give me give give the fives you think are worthy. But no, it's the same thing. What I tell you know when we when we're going through the instrument day of like flute day, I tell them low sound, high sound, open, open head joint, closed head joint. I show them the game where like depending on how far you put your finger inside the head joint, you can actually change the pitch. So we'll do like hot cross buns, um, and then uh, which is always fun, and then. I also, what I'll do is I'll have them, I wish I could have a video. So what I'll do is I'll have them put their finger, I'll have them make the flute embouchure so they make that poo, poop, and then I'll have them put their finger on their lips and then roll their finger down. And then what I, if for the kids, like if you're practicing off head joint, if they don't have the fitting kit, if they're blowing air and the air goes over and across the finger, that's the flute, that's like the very basics for a flute embouchure. Um, and that's kind of how I have the kids test it. And they and my my clinicians, they'll usually do that before we get to the head joint. But it's the same thing. If they can get high and low, it's a nice clear sound, an open sound, that's a five. Um, if they can hit both low and high, especially high clearly, because that means they have the air pressure. Um, and then, yeah, it's, you gotta, is it, what's that called? Is it like a Cupid's bow? Like what, there's a word for that. It's a teardrop. We just call it a teardrop? Yeah, okay, teardrop. Yeah. That and, um, it's not it's not a it's not a dead thing um but you do want to make sure that you're not uh you're looking out for the overbite um you can play flute if you have an overbite but depending on how bad the overbite is like for example my overbite is super bad i can't play flute um and i don't have a teardrop and but my even the way i play trumpet my um my airstream goes down so it doesn't lend itself to a good flute sound so be looking out in addition to the teardrop i also look out for uh, overbites as well um, what about oboe? So for oboe, we do oboe and bassoon at the same time. And I can't remember if the clinician does a crow on the reed with them or not. Mm -hmm. But uh, they will uh, ask the students to play the instrument. And obviously, they'll do the fingerings for them. And we'll just play up and down. 
and up and down the range of the instrument and ask them to perform the correct embouchure. I know they have them practicing the embouchure before they actually put the reed in the mouth. Um, if they're able to get a great sound on that, then you know they'll get a five. There's no specific range I'm looking for on either of these instruments. Um, as long as they can, you know, perform a decent amount of range, probably more than an octave, I think they give them a five and then they can try bassoon only if their hand size is big enough or if they're uh, around a certain height. I don't know what the height is exactly. I let them, the clinician decide what that is, but we haven't had any issues with oboe bassoon. Specifically hand size though. Uh, yeah. Hand size is a big one because like- Hand size know, is the main one. Mm -hmm. With, with, uh, with the- with the bassoon because you got to have like spider fingers like that's insane so yes. spider fingers s-p-a-h-d-e-r <laughs> uh, some <laughs> some spider fingers i don't do oboe and bassoon right now i used to um with us being title one the real issue is honestly it's not a matter of like i don't care if the kids get lessons you're not on bassoon or oboe that doesn't bother me i'll do i'll teach them myself like that's not a big deal the issue is just the cost of the reeds um, this is not a sponsored video or a sponsored video, but sponsored audio, but, um, shout out to Florida reads. If you're looking, if you're a band director who needs reads made by band directors, other band directors for cheap, hit them up. Um, they provide like they, all they do is make oboe and bassoon reads, um, and they sell them for cheaper and they're high quality cane and it's a high quality wrap and like the string they use is great. Um, so if you're looking for cheaper reads, go to them, but just with, I don't offer it outright, but if every now and then I'll have a kid be like, like a kid who's pri has prior music experience, I'm like, what about oboe or what about bassoon? And I say, do you want to try it? And if they say yes, I'll usually speak with that parent individually, just be like, hey, these reads cost a lot, so if your student gets it, no, I usually have that conversation. You know, I'll have that conversation afterward, and it's like, hey, your student has selected this instrument, just letting you know ahead of time this is a thing. Sometimes parents will be like, I don't know, and I'm very honest with the nut with their with the price because I'm not trying to mislead anybody. Um, but if the parents are like, I don't know, then we'll, you know, I'll talk to the student and we'll figure something out. And they've, I've never really had a problem with them choosing a different instrument. Um, but you not, sometimes the parents be like, Oh no, that's a problem. Yeah. No, no, no big deal. And I'll be like, just letting you know, they're going to break a lot. Um, like if the, if they put it up to an air conditioner and the vent goes too hard, the read might snap. Um, <laughs> So, and the parents are usually cool with it. So that's how I usually add bassoon and oboe, but I do not try it out outright. That's in, you know, um, that's not a title one accommodation. I've seen band directors in all places do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, we also let the students know that, uh, if they do test well on this instrument and decide to play it, that one is a competitive section, both oboe and bassoon that uh, they are encouraged to take private lessons at least to start out and that there is a, a higher expense for reads for, mm -hmm. this, for these particular instruments. Sure. All right, dive into clarinet for us. All right, so for clarinet, what I have the kids do on clarinet day when we're working on the clarinets and saxophones is the, the very simple embouchure that I have them do is I have them roll their bottom lip over their bottom teeth and then I have them put their finger in their mouth with their finger resting on the red part of their lip, not on the white, like, or the fleshy part, like the, like the regular skin, but make sure it's on the red part of their lip because that's where the vibration happens. And then I have them bite down on the top of their finger and I have them, and then I have them close their, the mouth around the finger with the embouchure set. And that's a very basic clarinet embouchure. And then obviously with, you know, giving them the join the band kit they can actually do it with the clarinet the plastic clarinet mouthpiece themselves um typically you want to avoid air leaks like if a kid has a, a septum issue um like a deviated septum uh and they've got air leaking all over the place you want to you need to avoid that at all costs making sure that they've got a nice a kid with an overbite is great for clarinet uh, it's uh so if you've got a kid who's struggling with an overbite on flute send them to the clarinet section um and they might do well for clarinet for the audition uh i try to for me i'm very strict with my fives but i do give out a lot of four pluses because you want to have a nice big clarinet section um if they can go over the break easily it's an automatic four if they can go all the way up to a high c that's like a four plus and if they can hit a high d um that's a five and anything and, and if it because typically when a kid blows into it you know that you'll have the clarinet will be they'll they'll be playing the mouthpiece but the the auditioner is doing all the fingerings right 
So as long as a kid is just blowing as long as hard as they can, they'll usually get up there if they can cross the break and they have that firmness. Um, and then obviously, you know, looking for tone, making sure it's not nasally, making sure it's not airy and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, five is an automatic five is hitting a D four plus is C and a four is over the break. So what is the difference for you for from C to D? Well, D is from what I was told and a clarinet player who's listening might be like, Andrew's an idiot. And you know, what? that's fair. Um, but what I was told, my, one of my intern teachers was a clarinet player and he always said that um, the difference between a C and a D is the openness of the embouchure. Like, are they able to maintain firm corners while also having a nice big ah vowel shape to where they can be firm enough to get up there? Because if you're if you're too if you're too tight in the jaw, you'll squeak by the time you get up there. Um, so, and by having if you can hit a D, that means they've got an, a good innate and good potential for a nice open sound in the higher range. Okay. Yeah. When we uh, prep, when they get in line for clarinet at our school, we prep them on uh, the E shape inside of the mouth, like they're hissing like a cat. Mm -hmm. And we show them the basic clarinet embouchure as well. We think of, we tell them to think of the milkshake face or think of their their lips as a drawstring bag around their finger, and then they'll try it on the clarinet mouthpiece or the clarinet itself. The clinician will do the fingerings for them. And we'll probably start on open G and go all the way down until all the keys are, are pressed and then pop the register key and waterfall the way all the way up to the high C. We've never asked for anything higher than that. But if they can get one, an in tune sound um, and two, a uh, really rich sound all the way through the register, they'll get a five or a five plus. Um, I agree that uh, having an overbite, the, the clarinet is a decent instrument to start on. If you have an overbite, um, it's actually a, 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 you do want a large clarinet section, but it is an instrument that a lot of people can play without too much trouble, which is nice. So yep. um, clarinet is usually a nice go to for students that are struggling on the other instruments. But yeah, and um, clarinet is a great go to if you don't get a five on alto, but we're about to get into that. Go into your <clears throat> alto thing. Well, I'm trying to think if I'm done with clarinet. Um, their fingers do need to be fat enough. <laughs> oh enough, yeah, you're thick right. Enough they gotta to cover the holes. Fat with a pH, everybody. Um, We're, we don't we so, don't wait discriminate here. So <laughs> there are some really really tiny sixth grade students. Their fingers just don't cover the holes enough all the way. Sure. And that's that's probably not going to be a great fit for them. Um, but they could try if they're really determined. You know, they can try. They can eat more. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't hey, know. kid, you're not fat enough. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Is it fat enough? No. Moving Dude. On. Oh, so, my God. But that's pretty much all we look for on clarinet. That's one of the large sections. And, in fact, this is a great opportunity not just to go to sax, but also to mention that sometimes it's not a bad idea to let your clinicians know you're either looking for more than normal on a specific instrument or less mm -hmm. than normal on a specific yeah. instrument. Cue I've them usually, in on your instrumentation for sure. I've only ever though done the, hey, we've got too many of blank. I need you to only send me fives or something like that. And we'll go from there. Or limit your, the number of fives to this many and we'll go from there. That's I typically do both. Like I'll, I'll usually go every year. I'll be like, hey, we like uh, two years ago, um, I did not recruit enough trombones. So this year when we were this past year when we did our COVID fittings, I recruited so many trombones. Um, and then vice versa, we had a lot of, of flutes. So I made a point to limit flutes. I'll usually go, I'll tell the clinicians in both directions just because I'm a, I'm OCD and I, I gotta make sure everything's perfect, but, um, I'm a perfectionist in only selective ways. Uh, not when, not when it comes to cleaning my house, but, um, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but, uh, for sure. All right. Dive into the saxophone, bro. Well, for me, for us, it's, uh, the hand size, like oboe to bassoon, it's clarinet to sax. So we already assume they can make a, sa a sound on the saxophone. Right. Uh, I think we can all agree. Saxophone is very easy to make a sound. It's very difficult to make a great sound. So only, f uh, students that make a really nice classical sound on the saxophone get a five. How about you? Oh, I, it's my favorite Sam Hazel quote is it's like he does it for the whole note but he also mentioned it on the saxophone is the saxophone is the 
easiest instrument to start, but is the hardest instrument to master. And if you know anything about Sam Hazo's writing, he loves his saxophones. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I do, my rule is you have to get a five on saxophone to play saxophone. Um, if you don't get a five, you don't get to play it. And then you, and they, those students usually end up playing clarinet instead. Um, and then they become great clarinet players and whatever. Um, just because, you know, obviously everybody, if you've done music, if you've been in, mu in a music ed class from at college for more than five minutes, you know that everybody likes playing saxophone. Um, so to limit that, that's how I just limit that right off the bat. You got to get a five. If there's ever a scenario where I don't have enough altos who got fives, I will open up to four pluses and maybe fours, but it's the only the best of the best get to be picked on alto just to limit the instrumentation right away um and i always have exactly as many altos as we need um same thing we look for hand size um and i also look for uh students who were really really uh in terms of if you like if you need to get more saxophones later in the year look for your clarinets who are flat um and then but really good readers because if they're really good readers they'll be able to switch clefs or switch keys really easily not clefs um but then it's the same thing you know making sure they have a nice solid overbite making sure that they understand for saxophone that the embouchure you don't want to have too big of an overbite because unlike the clarinet the saxophone embouchure needs the mouthpiece goes straight in right um so if they have too big of an overbite they're going to have embouchure is issues and that the alto mouthpiece will be placed too low um but yeah it's you know make a great sound make sure it's nice and loud make sure it's nice and strong but it's no no honking if you honk you're like a three or a four um we look for students who obviously it's going to be loud and there's not going to be that much control but if it's if it's a decent sound um we'll give them those fives you know i'm going to write down right now i want to see students that can naturally play loud and soft on the saxophone oh Sa just like as, sound, right? as just as yeah, but as part as they're fitting, ask them, okay, play loud, okay, now play soft. And students uh, that have the widest range, you can actually play soft, get, will get the highest score. I like that. That's cool. I'm going to do that too. I'm going to write it down somewhere. I don't know. My phone's not with me. <laughs> cool. All right. So uh, I'll dive into trumpet next. For trumpet, yeah. we By look the way, we're for... both trumpet players. So yeah. if, we, if we say anything about your instrument that insults you, um, we don't care. Everybody uh, listening literally just went, that makes a lot of sense. No, no, right? It's two yeah, idiots. That's yep. fine. Two idiots. So, two idiot trumpets. Yep. So, we're about to school you on trumpet. No, listen. So, <laughs> for uh, trumpets, uh, what we listen for at West Glades is a nice brass sound, open sound. We don't want it to be too pinched, and they need to be able to play three partials. Um, as long as the, the middle G and low C are nice and, and full and relaxed and they have to pinch a little to get the high C, that's no problem. Um, but if they struggle to get the high C, they're not going to get a five on that instrument. Yep. What about you? So for trumpet, euphonium, and trombone, it's concert B flat, concert F, concert B flat. Um, if you can do all three of those things, like you said, like basically what you said, if you can do all of those things, it's like a four, four plus. Um, if you can hit higher, it is a five. Um, if you can hit higher, it's a five. If you can, uh, play lower, that lends itself to a higher score as well. Um, I really make, I'm really, really a stickler since I'm a brass player and I have the, 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 the knowledge for it and the ear for it. I really make sure that students are aware about tone. We talk about, you know, making sure there's no closed teeth, making sure it's not harsh, making sure they're not blowing, especially making sure it's not flat. If there's any pitch issues at all on any of the instruments, obviously that's a really bad score, but especially for trumpet um, and for brass players, if they're flat, um, it's no good. Also making sure, uh, we didn't mention this. I don't think we mentioned this, puff cheeks which seems like a given, but just making sure just to, just to say it. <laughs> um, no, that's actually really good. Uh, yeah. Tell all your clinicians, nobody should be puffing their cheeks when they get their five. Yeah. No, no, no puff cheeks at all. If you puff your cheeks and you can't bring them in, you're not getting even a three. Um, like it's not happening. Uh, just, just to reinforce that. But um, yeah, other than, you know, the B flat FB flat and then any, any plus range, it's, it's good. Um, oh, we forgot to mention for saxophone. If you have, if you're getting too many saxophones, the reed trick. 
Yeah, go ahead. So I forgot this. Oh, sorry. Um, with saxophone, um, actually, you know what? That story can come later. Um, because we can we can get into it. But uh, but yeah. So um, there are tricks. Just a heads up. There are tricks that you can do if you have too many of certain instruments. There are certain tricks you can do for certain instruments to um, prevent <laughs> prevent any further add-ons. But that's my kind of thing for a trumpet. Um, you want to talk when about you, your horn? Well, what's up? I have a few more things to add. So when you talked about if they have pitch issues, are you talking about like that nebulous limbo sound like between low C and middle G on trumpet? Talk about the double buzz? Like, it's like a, well, it's like a lip bend and they don't know how to pop it up or pop it down to the right partial. Is that what you mean? Um, no, the in-between buzz is fine because usually that in-between buzz can get, it usually gets fixed in the fitting. Cause like, you know, brass players, they'll, they'll hit like brass players the the best part of the fitting for brass players is usually the first 30 seconds because once they hit all three partials brass players as they're doing their fitting and their embouchure starts to form they'll usually stick to one pitch right like you'll have a kid hit c cgc and then they really love high c and then they can't get low again um yeah uh, so what i was gonna say is like but do you know what i'm talking about where a yes. kid can like they're they're blowing and they don't they can't play higher they can't play lower they're just like in between Yes. two two different partials and they're just getting like this weird sound if they um, can't that's manip- definitely like a no 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 for yeah me. if they can't if you can't if a brass player cannot manipulate their embouchure purely on instinct with zero instruction it's a no yeah. um, because as a brass player especially if they don't have the greatest ear yet because you teach them that ear by by singing and blah 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 um you know if if they don't have that ear but they do have the instinct that's good. If they don't have the instinct and they're just guessing and they're in between partials and it's an absolute disaster, then yeah, that's that's a two, if not like a mm-hmm. two minus, which I've, I've, I've had to give out two minuses in the past whenever I've been a part of a fitting team. <laughs> it's a thing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, there was one other thing I was going to mention. Oh, yeah. Trumpets that if, if they come in and they're blowing, you know, middle C or higher, but they can't get lower. That's torn. also an issue. Yeah, torn. Um, that's usually when I say go try the oboe, and that usually works out. Oh yeah, because I I love double reeds because they're the buzz. It's not a buzz, but it's close. It's it it's operates. like a, it's just a tight embouchure, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. That's a good that's a good point to try them out for. I might and I might find those kids who can't play or like Maynard Ferguson's but can't play low. I might try them out on oboe this year. That's a good idea. Uh, dig into horn. Okay, uh, for horn. And actually, this is important, and we should talk. We'll talk about this after we get through all the instruments. But we do ear test for mm-hmm. not just for horn, uh, but for several other instruments as well. Actually, we ear test everybody, uh, but it's specific instruments that we're most concerned about. Horn is probably number one, and that's simply because the partials on the instrument are so close together. Uh, so they do have to pass in a, a certain score on our ear test before we say that you can try horn, and we also ask them to try trumpet before they try horn. They have to do well on trumpet before um, they move on to horn. And by well, I don't mean they have to get a five, but they should be, you know, be able to play at least two notes on trumpet, and then they can move to horn because the embouchure for horn is is slightly different, and they might be using a horn embouchure on trumpet, and that might be why they don't sound that great on trumpet, and then they can sound amazing on horn. But uh, if that's the case, the main thing for us for horn is the ear. Uh, what about you? Uh, yeah, I don't do a prerequisite ear test, um, and the only ear test that I have students do for is, is the horn. Um, they do they they do an ear test and a singing test um, at at the fitting. They like the the clinician will probably typically play a pitch, and then they have to match the pitch on their voice. And then as they're matching pitch on the horn, like clinician plays, student plays. If they get into the if they can't voice it on their voice like they, they they get in the general vicinity like they go higher or they go lower but if on the horn if they don't match the exact pitch but they are in like one or two or three partials away and you know horn partials one or two or three partials is not that far um if they're in the general vicinity i will award them a higher score um if they're perfect you're a five which that's that's not on it's not rare but it it's like it's not uncommon it's you gotta you kind of have to find it but i will if they can sing in the general vicinity and they can hit the note in the general vicinity that at least means that it's there it's in their head like it's ringing in their head in the right in the right area and with and through more practice and through 
consistency, they'll be able to get those ranges. I'm a little bit more lenient, but you know, it always it usually evens out to where the, the horn players have the range they need that they need to. Yeah, we've got the kids, uh, the clinician will sing and then the kids will play. And we ask them just to do C E G and mm -hmm. you know, in different orders and yep. uh, see if they can understand higher and lower and then if they can play the exact pitch that's being sung or played to them. Um, then that'll be a perfect score. But they do have to be able to play it. Yeah. For us. All right. Sure. So you already talked about trombone or you and euphonium. Did you want to add anything? So yeah, for the trombone, um, <laughs> for the trombone, I also have them uh, do a slide test um, where I'll, it'll basically they'll be playing like a concert F, and then they have to the clinician will bring the slide will control the slide and bring the slide all the way out to sixth position, and if while they're playing. If they can instinctively continue to blow with a stable embouchure as the horn gets longer, if they have that instinct, then that means that they're good for they're good for a trombone. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, when you when you bring the slide out and the instrument gets longer, they'll just give out, and then <sighs> and you you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Um, and that means that you're, they're not good for trombone because part of you have to have that slide instru instinct. You have to while feeling the instrument is literally longer. What are you going to do about it? kind of thing um in addition to the b, F, b flat f b flat um sometimes i like to if they can hit b flat f b flat i also see if they can hit low f and i also see if they can hit um high d um and anything above that is also bonus for euphonium uh if you if you if trombone's too high play euphonium if you want to be a trombone player but be smart <laughs> Sorry, trombones. Um, my wife's gonna hit me. Um, if you want to play, if you want to play trombone, because my wife's a trombone player. If you want to play trombone, but be smart, you play euphonium. And then if tuba is too low or tuba, you're, you're too high on the tuba, you play euphonium. Um, and then also, if you have poor lip posture on the trumpet, um, for the student, like later in the year, if you have a student who gets who gets fitted for trumpet, turns out it was a fluke and they can't hit above a high, like a, a, a middle G or second space A, they have poor lip posture put them on euphonium um but that's kind of how i do the two what about you for trombone we uh the ear test is very important just like the horn and i'm going to incorporate the slide test that you mentioned i haven't done that before we do look for a higher set uh in their in their playing so what we mean by that is if they can play f b flat d um in the higher range of the trombone we prefer them to play trombone but if they're not able to uh, play B flat F B flat like on trumpet then if, let's say that they play B flat and F or F B flat and something lower than that we ask them to try euphonium and we also are looking for arm length as well um, but if some if if somebody with insufficient arm length is looking for it, it is very uh, motivated to play trombone we'll invite them to look into getting a trigger trombone we try to start as many beginners on triggers as we can anyway but that's uh conversation for another day and then um or one of those slide extenders that uh but i haven't seen any of my students uh ever get those but i know that they exist but if they are if they get a five on trombone but their arm is too small we'll try to figure something out um and then i already talked about euphonium um but again well, it to, has to be to put nice, in sorry sure. uh for trombone i typically don't discriminate against arm size like you you've met marissa um for those who don't know marissa lopez my wife she i the minute i met her i was like i can't discriminate on size because she's a trombone player but she's five two um and she was only ever she was never taller than five two so and for her to be able to play trombone i was like well works for me so, <laughs> so. we don't discriminate uh height to trombone like we do hand size for sax or bassoon Okay. Um, like I said, there are ways around uh, trombone players with shorter arms to play. Like I said, we'll get them on a trigger trombone or get a slide extender. When it comes to the hand size on sax and bassoon, I don't know if there's key extenders or anything like that. So sure. um, I'm just What's saying that that's extender? something. So it's like uh, something that clips to their slide and it that. like they just throw their it's like they have to throw their slide out and then they catch it i don't know you could google it but i literally just um, i just tell them just dig dig your right shoulder in and you'll you'll gain like three or four inches and get over it yeah yeah you know? um and we don't do a specific height we just let students know ahead of time hey you Got do it. need you know you you want if you have long arms this is a great instrument for you that's basically all we say if you have long you, arms this is okay. great 
you know. I thought, but we're not just, testing their arm size at the actual fitting. Got it. But I just want to make it clear. Size. I just want to make it clear that you weren't like a you have to be this tall to ride kind of guy. <laughs> only for bassoon and sax. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'm going to add is obviously we want great tone on all these instruments to get a five. I guess sure. that goes without saying. But All right. Tuba. I guess I'll start with tuba then. Um, yeah, go for it. Uh, you have to play the low B flat and it has to sound great. Um, and then if you can change partials at least one time, that's that, that'll be a five. If you can only play low B flat, I don't know if we can work with that. Um, but if you're really determined to play tuba and that's the case, then, uh, you, I usually talk to the students one-on-one -on -one and, and try, maybe try them on euphonium or something and see if they could change partials there and then move it back to tuba. But they definitely have to be able to play the low B flat. And we do tell them that for students that are smaller, we do have three quarter size tubas. And so we usually don't have a problem in the tuba section when it comes to size. Yep. How about you? Uh, B flat, low B flat is a four. Low B flat and, or four, it's like four or four plus. Uh, low B flat and F, um, like bottom of the staff F is a five if you can stabilize b flat and you can stabilize f and be able to instinctively move between the two partials you're good you're fine um usually uh if a student can't hit f i won't discriminate i i, I won't i, I gotta say start to trim because you're not that intense i'm sorry christian's <laughs> a nice guy everybody he's not he's not like he's not a mean person i promise um thank you uh, yeah, sorry. Um, but typically, I won't. I won't um, hold that against the kid if they can't get above a B flat. If B flat's just their favorite note and that's all they play, because usually, I, one visit with a clinician, in my experience, will just fix it. Um, and then, because it's because it's the difference between F and, F and B flat is such a drastic feeling in the embouchure that there's no way you can mix the two up. You know what I mean? Yes. So with if they can hit if they can't hit B uh, F but they can smack a B flat like it's no business that's okay I, I fine um, but B if you can't hit B flat you're not playing it period that's and I tell them that and I make a big deal out of my tubas I love I love my tuba section I make fun of them all the time but they know that I love them because you know we I call them the the teen, the teenage mutant tuba section uh, or the teenage mutant ninja tubas. Um, oh, I thought you told me tuba queens and tuba knights. I'll call them individually. My, my, my girl tubas are my tuba queens. And then the boys, I call them knights. But as a gang, they are the teenage, teenage mutant ninja tubas. Um, and it's, <laughs> I'm going to steal that one. I love it. It's, I don't know why. Cause they, I don't tell them this from class. Like they, they don't tell each other this, the seventh graders and sixth graders, like the eighth graders, they don't talk about it. But every, every year, every time we have a tuba sectional day, they always walk in tuba, tuba. You don't have to tell them to do it. And it's like, I don't know where they get it from. It's just a, that maybe the instrument tells them the whispers in their ear like uh like um what's the like parcel tongue <laughs> uh mm -hmm. with like mm -hmm. with like the snake we do um, tuba tuesday and uh tuesday. we encourage them to uh take tuba seriously and they get a t-shirt sure so but yeah no those are those, those are my tuba things and then if you can if you can hit low f like hot mama um <laughs> like that's 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 game uh what about um okay so do we want to percussion Okay, so my percussion fitting, uh, this is the original story that I got from Danny Suarez. He's, a, he's a, one of my best friends. He's a band director at Azalea Middle School in Pinellas. Uh, this is how he does it, and then I'm going to tell how I modified it, but um, both work fine. The way he does it is he'll have a percussion, and I do this too, he'll have a percussion audition on a separate day. I'll usually announce the percussion audition the first day of school because then the students who are super, super organized... Um, will tell their parents right away and like because you're always going to have the kids like i want to play drums and like you can't they, obviously you know we all we, everybody else gets those kids in every in every band um but for the students but just because they say they want to play percussion doesn't mean anything so if you're if the student is organized enough to tell their parents on the very first day of school that their drum f their, their percussion fitting is on a certain day they're already probably good enough <laughs> you know what i mean um, and that takes care of the organization issue. What Danny does after that is on, on the percussion audition day, he'll actually have them, uh, he'll have them come in the room and he'll sit, they'll sit in the band room and they'll just kind of sit, they'll sit apart from each other. Um, but just wait for the percussion audition to start. And what Danny will do is he'll just be in his office pretending to be busy. Um, if a kid talks, he'll, he'll wait a couple seconds 
and then he'll call that kid in. If he talks or like moves around or touches the instruments or they, it, it can't handle himself, uh, they'll, he'll call that student in and he'll say, sorry, I'm, uh, you, you have not been chosen. Uh, have a good day. And they'll go, oh, okay. Um, or he'll, if he doesn't say that, he'll say something. I don't know exactly what he says, but he'll say something to get them out of the room. And then when he has enough percussionists left, that's usually what he does. And that's the section he ends up with. It's hilarious. I've seen him do it. It's really funny. I had to bite my tongue so I didn't laugh while while it was going on. And he, he treats it, he, he treated it like a game of Survivor. Um, it's like or it's like too hot to handle where he's like with La, he's Lana. <laughs> Oh, and then they're like, Lord, and they're like, oh, no. Yeah, we watched that show, everybody. Um, but um, yeah, it was uh, so he, he's very much like that. The way I do it is on top of that, in addition to testing them to see if they're just quite it's the and for him. It's, it's the kids who say nothing and do nothing. If you can sit there for like five, six minutes and just be a student and not be disruptive in a room by yourself, you, you get percussion, which is like the golden quality of all percussionists. <laughs> um but what I do on top of that is I'll, 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 I won't dismiss them until after they audition. So while they're waiting, I'm listening to hear if they're being disruptive. But while they're waiting, I'll bring in kids one on one and I'll actually do like a short, you know, hand coordination test and steady beat and switching hands and all that stuff. Um, but I usually for me, it's a score between it's a combination of their actual pedagogy in addition to can they behave. Danny is such a good percussion teacher. Um, he doesn't worry about the pedagogy part because and I've seen his percussion. His percussionist can jam. I don't know how he does it, but um, and he doesn't bring in clinicians for his percussionists either. Um, he does have a percussion class, but even when he was at Diego before he went to Azalea, he, he he churned him out. So he doesn't really worry about pedagogy. But if you're if you're not as it's if you're a little more insecure about like I am, then I try them out. What about you? So uh, we just monitor behavior leading up to the fitting, and we do the fitting after they've tried after we've done the official fitting with all the wind instruments. Mm -hmm. So it'll be the day after the wind instrument fitting. Mm. We try to we try to whittle down all the way from 50 kids wanting to play percussion to about maybe 20. And uh, th so we, in hopes that uh, some of those kids fall in love with a different instrument before sure. we have to give them the bad news. Same. And then at that point, um, if they have great behavior, that's like 50% of their score. We don't actually put that, we don't uh, put a number to it, but it is half of what we consider. The other half is gonna be, have they been paying attention in class and can they can they sight read some rhythms up to what we've taught already taught in class? Mm -hmm. Can they do some of these hand coordination exercises? Can they uh, prepare a rhythm exercise to count for us or clap for us? I like that, um, that's cool. And uh, and then we decide from there. The, okay. the basically the top scores and the the best behaved. Sure. Um, other helpful tips and because but that that's all the instruments. Other helpful help. Do you have anything else for any specific instrument? Yeah. So I guess we can start with any other helpful tips. So that's how we basically fit all the instruments. But uh, I did mention ear test. I wanted to let everybody know. So we do an ear test before the actual fitting so we know who's uh has a great ear we also do a, a a a rhythm test it's the summer listening survey so we do the summer listening survey before the fitting so we know how they all score on those and we try to get students that are highest on the summer listening survey spread across all the instruments or at least the most important instruments that require a great ear and for us that's going to be oboe it's going to be horn and it's going to be trombone and in some cases too but depending on how like our tubas have been have been performing based on how they were fitted we might include tuba in there as well but we try to get somebody with like you know a really high score on on each instrument so they can kind of be the leader of the pack but sure. i do encourage doing an ear test of some sort um before you're fitting just so you know outside of what your clinician or whoever is fitting tells you about their playing sure um Inviting your administration is the coolest thing you can do because the fitting day for a middle school, even if you're a high school band program uh, and you have a beginning band, which is not uncommon um, for smaller programs, if you have a, if you bring in your admin because it's the one day of the year that doesn't look like any other day. And it's also a really great way for you to flex on classroom management because you've got students running around everywhere. It seems, if you don't know what you're looking at, it's 
it's chaos. Um, and I always invite a couple parents too. Like I have some of my more helpful and more present band parents because I don't have a BPO. Um, but we for the student for the parents and for the admin, I, I bring them in. And especially my principal, my, like I think I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, my principal loves fitting day. He shows up every year and at fitting day with his con- with his Coniston band polo on, ready to rock. Um, and every now and then he'll actually try out, try an instrument. Like uh, a couple years ago, he actually, there was one student who was, who got like tuba and he was super, super cocky about him getting tuba. And he was like to the point where it was almost a little obnoxious. And my principal walked up and then did the tuba fitting, uh, and schooled that kid. And it was hilarious. Um, it was, it was awesome. So please invite your administration, even if they're only there for like five minutes, uh, it's to one of your fitting classes. It is absolutely beautiful yes i agree if you have no music stores around you using colleagues or student volunteers is great this is actually a great recruiting and vertical alignment opportunity see if you can get some high school band students especially ones that you feed to feed into come and help you with the fitting educate them beforehand but absolutely it's great even if they're if they're not doing the actual instrument fitting themselves have them do the non-fitting stuff so that you can be free to fit your own students the way you like. Yep. That's a great, great thing to do. Yep. Um, Try not to micromanage the fitting uh, for your own professional practice. It's just, you know, especially if you're bringing in a team of professionals, your job is to facilitate management and just be the hype person and be all over the place, making sure everybody's super excited and staying happy um, and having a good time, making sure no one's on fire. Um, Do not micromanage your own fitting because there's a lot of moving parts and the less work you can do, the more effective you can be in your own room. Um, And then a big time, I mean, you wrote this down and I do this all the time, but I would highly recommend practicing the Amish. Do what I doing what I do is you know, flute day, a tuba day, um, clarinet day, saxophone day. It, it gives you a chance to give the students a chance to practice the Amish beforehand. But it's also a great way, which is great because then they can get practice on the instruments that they are excited for, if not all of them. But it's also a great way for you to hype up the instruments individually. So if you're missing out on tubas, you can spend tuba day getting real hype about tuba. Or if you're talking about trombones and you want to, you want to, you want to know who your trombones are compared to your euphoniums, and you want to know who the, like which students are lacking certain brain cells, you can show them certain <laughs> trombone, some trombone alpine skiing videos, and like get them really hyped up. It's a great opportunity it's a great way to spend the first couple of first couple of days of school in addition to your rhythm and your classroom management and your note identification and theory and all that stuff and then the last helpful tip we have written here is how much time after the fitting um, is there before we do a draft and placement for us we try to do the fitting at the early end of the week and the placement on the friday so that they have the weekend. In fact, it has worked out in uh, in years past where the fitting, um, sorry, the placement is done right before a three day weekend, so they have extra time to get their instrument. What about you? Mm-hmm. Uh, I if if my if my fitting ends up having to be on a Friday, we do it on the following Monday. If but I try to make sure that my fitting. The reason why I said that second Thursday is be, of the week of school is because that second Friday is draft day. That way, again, they can usually go home and they have two days or a couple days to get their instrument. I usually give my kids a week, um, and we'll go into that later. Um, but I give my students a week to get their instruments just because just because Same. it gives me time to cover other things. But so, but yeah, I usually do it the day after. So that way students can maintain the hype. I tell them, you know, go home, talk to your parents about what instruments you guys did well. I yell at the top of my lungs at least seven times at the end of fitting day, do not get an instrument. I don't care if you got, I don't care if you got a five on your favorite instrument. No one cares. Do not, no one cares yet. Do, I say, <laughs> I say the word no one cares to my students way too often, but I say no one cares yet. Do not buy, do not go rent your instruments yet because you don't know what you're playing. Congratulations. You got your fives. whoop de freaking do. No one cares yet. Don't move. Um, and then 20, 24 hours later, then I say, now everyone cares. Now we care. Go get your stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, is there anything else? Yeah. And the only thing I was going to say is we do uh, two or three days where we do instrument presentations, where we go over the ins and outs of each instrument and types of personalities that go well with this instrument and things to look out for. So you, so you, you take, you take two or three that, days? Yeah. Okay. I take two weeks. 
well, two or three days just on that, then a few other days for uh, other other things. We and then we do rhythm and breathing every day. But go, it's yeah. like it's usually the two or three days before the fitting, or the the like the the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right before the Monday of the fitting. We will do those three instruments. I'm uh, sorry, the three instrument families will in brass percussion and go over the ins and outs, things that they're going to need to look for. So, yep. so we're going to incorporate the embouchure stuff that I'm stealing from you probably uh, the week before as well to make it you five, it. you know, make it five days or something like you that. You got so. it, bro. All right. Uh, All right. So, so this has been our fitting episode. That, yeah. I hope you guys found that helpful. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks for tuning in. in. Next episode, by the way, episode three, we're going to go into the draft. So if you're looking for one after the other, um, we're going to air this. It does air a week later. We can fix that. Um, but it's going to um, go like next episode. Episode three is draft time. So if you're listening to this, and you want to dive right in. This did go a little bit over an hour, but um, that's OK. I felt like we were able to cover everything and give you guys as much as we could. Um, but we might been... edit it down to an hour. Oh yeah, so. we'll we'll do our best. What, um, you, but what you just said you might just cut out anyway. <laughs> that's fine. But this has been the Florida Band Podcast. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys next time. Good luck fitting these instruments to your students. Fitting these who? <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. It. Peace out, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Florida Band Podcast. Follow us on YouTube and contact us at FL Band Podcast. At